So we see the believer looks forward to this glorious termination or destination. Uh, that is the believer, the simple believer. That is the, the simplest, humblest, most broken, contrite sinner. The stupidest, dumbest, uneducated, illiterate sinner that ever lived who by childlike faith accepts Christ as his Savior, has a destination fixed for him that has been the envy of the ages since man showed upon this earth, the golden age of perfect peace and righteousness, the golden age of absolute perfection, is the believer's destination in a sinless body exactly like the only sinless man that ever lived. And so Paul, upon telling you this, cries out, what shall we then say to these things? Man, you can't say nothing. That's just too good to be true. But it's true. Thy word is truth. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, and if anything showed God was for you, it was verse 28, 29, and verse 30. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, the world can be against you but the world will pass away and melt with a fervent heat. The flesh can be against you, but the flesh is going to die and rot in the grave or be redeemed when the Lord comes. And the devil can be against you, but someday he'll dwell in a lake of fire. If God be for us, who can be against us? Great question. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also Freely, 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 there's that word. And remember our comments on this a little bit earlier. Notice especially the comments we made upon this word back in Romans chapter 3, where we spoke about Eve's sin of omitting the word freely and compared it with Romans 3.24. How shall he not with him also freely give us not just salvation, not just justification, not just redemption. Give us all things. And this takes us over to the promise I just read in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, which said, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. He that spared not his own son, well will he spare you if he spared not the old world, Second Peter chapter 2, and spared not the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Second Peter chapter 2, and spared not his own son, a sinless man, Romans chapter 8. How shall you escape, brother, if you neglect so great salvation? You won't. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody. Why? It is God that justifies. And, of course, in these new Bibles, you'll find it written, Is it God that justifies? I mean, very typical wipeout. We had a word for it in the army, but I wouldn't use it as a Christian. But these new Bibles make verse 33 a question mark. Who shall lay anything to charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifies? You see, what's the reasoning beside, uh, behind this uh, uh, childish perversion of the Word of God? Well, these people are basically blasphemous, wicked, and stupid, even though many of them are saved. Their old nature has the upper hand all the time when they come to the Bible. And when they read the passage and see the question mark in verse 31, and the question mark in 32, and the question mark in 33, and the question mark in 34, they take for granted the whole thing just had to be question marks clear through. That is, their reasoning is, if God doesn't follow the pattern they think should be established, they will jolly well change his word to set up their own pattern. And don't you let these educated asses ever convince you they're worried about the original manuscripts. Any man with any scholarly training knows there are no question marks. Punctuation as such in the so-called original manuscripts. So when you put in the question mark, you're putting it in on conjecture. They say, is it God that justifies? Why, bless your soul, nobody would question God's justification but the devil. Now, somebody might question, if God be for us, who could be against us? 
Some of them might question who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect. Some of them might question who is he that condemns. Those are legitimate questions. Why, is it God that justifies? That's not a legitimate question. Everything in Romans up to now has been talking about God justifying. Being justified by his blood. Chapter 5, 9. What do you mean, is it God that justifies? RSV, ASV, New ASV, and all this pious whitewash and garbage and trash you put out so people will think you're an authority. You know how these scholars recommend that, recommend that garbage? So you will think that if they have enough sense to order the text, they're a greater authority than the text. Now, can't you figure that out? Take it as it is an authorized version. It is God that justifies. Or if he justifies, then a man's going to have a tough time laying anything to the charge of God's elect. Who is he that condemneth? Good question. Somebody will try. It is Christ that died. You're going to have a hard time condemning. Christ died and bore the condemnation. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, what would you do if you made that a question? Do you see how stupid this business is? If you insist they all have to be questions, and there are two questions in 35, why don't you make a question out of the end of verse 34? Why don't you say, Who is he that condemn it? Is it Christ that died? Is it Christ that has risen again? Is Christ at the right hand of God? Does Christ make intercession for us? No, you, you, you know, if I wasn't saved, I'd have the word for you. And these people who change this text and put up these question marks, many of them are professing Christians that pride themselves in contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. Horse feathers, brother. That's the devil. Don't you know his footprints when you see him? When you find monkey tracks all over the Bible, you know somebody's been monkeying with it. All right. 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Good question. Shall tribulation? Implied answer, no. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. Look at Psalm 44, verse 22 in this passage. These things here have to do, of course, with the tribulation. Notice seven items matching each year in the tribulation. And yet they're true of any Christian, any generation. And if you want to see the great truth of these pastures, you should read the work printed in 1871 called The Cross, The Cross, and The Crown. Or if you can't get this edition, be sure and obtain an edition, an edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'm sure Brother Rawlings has these in his bookstore. Fox's Book of Martyrs, edited by Forbush. And learn the meaning of the text. Can tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril of the sword, separation from the love of Christ? No, sir. And this divine uh, pilgrimage and this, these holy accounts given of what these uh, people went through, you'll find the truth of the text illustrated beyond your wildest imagination. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Then a great verse. Nay, in all these things, what things? In tribulation, in distress, in persecution, in famine, in nakedness, in peril, in the sword. In all these things. And Paul says, in all things give thanks, in everything give thanks. In all these things we are not conquerors. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Or he says in another place, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengtheneth me. Or in another place, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. There it is. Isn't that beautiful? 
more than conquerors through him. Paul says, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. You can't be a conqueror through yourself. You can't overcome the Goliaths in your life and stone the giants of the world, the flesh, and the devil in your life as a Christian if you trust in your strength. It is not by might or by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Verse 37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded. One of his favorite expressions. He said, I am persuaded he is able to keep Papa Child committed to him against that day. For I am persuaded that neither death, if you drop dead, you still are accepted in Jesus Christ in the Beloved, nor life, if you go on living, you are still in him and in his love, nor angels, fallen angels or otherwise, nor principalities, the princes of Daniel, the spiritual powers, nor powers, the devil, demons, devils, nor things present, nothing going on right now, nor things to come, nothing coming in the future, nor height, the top of the universe, nor depth, the bottom of the ocean, nor any other creature. There's that word. Leave it just like it stands, the King James. Don't you say creation, put on airs, nor any other creature. If it isn't named, if it isn't archangel, angel, cherubim, seraphim, demon, devil, or something else, then it doesn't make any difference. Any other creature, if the lion swallows you in the Colosseum, any other creature, if a mad dog tears you limb from limb in a communist dungeon, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And therein one of the greatest and grandest chapters in the whole of Scripture. That's a tremendous chapter. That chapter talks about the two natures, about how to live following the Spirit instead of the flesh, about your relation to the Spirit, about your relation to the flesh in those matters, what's going to happen to your flesh later when you get a perfect body, and what to do in the meantime when you suffer and go through tribulation in this life, waiting for that time, what God's going to do in you and through you and for you. And out of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, that is one of the very best. Every Christian ought to memorize at least half of it. All right, on we go, chapter 9. Now in chapter 9, we come to a little bit different uh, tune. We've been playing here about the Christian relationship to the law and death and Christ and sin. We've been talking about salvation and justification. But now when we get to chapter 9, we have a switch. And in chapter 9 and chapter 10, Paul goes back for a while, and in chapter 11 too, and begins to talk about Israel. We don't reach the practical portions of the book of Romans that deal with everyday life until we get to chapter 12, 13, and 14. Chapter 12, 13, and 14 deal with practical subjects, everyday conduct, as it is related to the Christian life. But in Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 11, and much of chapter 10, these three chapters are a sort of a parenthesis placed in there that go back and deal with Israel. We must remember that he was talking about the Jews' relationship to conscience and the law back in Acts chapter 2, and then in Acts chapter, or right, Romans 2, but and then in Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, he dealt exclusively with the child of God. In Romans chapter 3, he talked about how the Christian was justified, how God's plan solved the problem of law and conscience. In chapter 4, he talked about how the Christian's salvation by faith was typified before the law in the Old Testament. In Romans 5, he talked about how your death is related to Adam. In Romans 6, he talked about how your death is related to the death of Christ. In Romans 7, he talked about your death as it was related to the law. In Romans chapter 8, he talked about the death of your dead body as is related to the future coming of Christ and the redemption of your body. And now he returns for a while to Israel. 9-1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Paul would mention the conscience a great deal. He mentions following his conscience in the book of Acts. He mentions the defiled conscience over there in Titus. 
He mentions the good conscience, and you might check these passages in 1 Corinthians 8, 7 and 2 Timothy 1, 3. A conscience that is not illuminated by the Holy Ghost can become seared, 1 Timothy 4, and defiled, Titus chapter 1. A man's conscience bears witness to things, as we've plainly uh, found out in our discussion of Romans chapter 2 in the heathen, and remember in particular in regards to this subject, uh, the exposition of uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 15. But the conscience can become seared and defiled by constant misuse. The first time you smoked, you hid to smoke the cigarette. The second time you smoked, you trembled while you did it, but you did it. The third time you smoked, you chuckled nervously. The fourth time you laughed defiantly. The fifth time you yawned. And the sixth time it was habit. A man said, well, it don't hurt. It used to hurt. Somebody said, I don't see any harm in it. You used to. Trouble is, you, you're an evolutionist. You mistake degeneration for maturity. You mistake rot for growth. You're like the man that finally shot his watchdog because it barked and kept him up all night. And an hour after he shot that dog, a man came into his house and stole everything he had. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Well, there's the old contradiction again, see? In Philippians he said rejoice, and again I say rejoice, and rejoice evermore, and rejoice for those that rejoice. And Jesus said, I say these things to you that your joy may be full, and ask that your joy may be full. Peter says, I write these things to you that your joy may be full. The Bible says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy. And then I have continual sorrow in my heart. You see? You see? The Christian life is a paradox. The unsaved man can't understand it. A lady down in Pensacola lost a little four-year-old boy. He fell in a catch basin, a, a sink, a septic tank, and drowned in a septic tank. You couldn't hardly think of a more horrible death for a young child. And that mother didn't want to see her baby after the accident and preferred a closed coffin. And she wept a little, but she thanked God and rejoiced and gave a testimony at the funeral that her little boy was with Jesus Christ. People thought she'd lost her mind. You know why? They can't understand it. They can't understand the verse that says, Sorrow not as others who have no hope. And when Paul says, I am a continual sorrow, he means I have it simultaneous with a continuous rejoicing. <laughs> it's a strange thing, isn't it? No one in the world thinks we're nuts. I guess we are. Song of Solomon, he, speaking of the garden, he said, I went down in the garden to see the fruits and see the nuts. <laughs> have all kinds of nuts, you know. Some Christians like pecan nuts, you know, take a long time growing, but they're good when they get there. Some like hickory nuts are just hard as can be, like a walnut, you know, you've got to break your teeth getting into them. And I guess some Christians are like, uh, well, uh, they, it's that black nut, you know, shaped like a toe. I was going to call it by its real name, but with freedom of speech going in America, I don't guess you can say that kind of thing anymore. <laughs> All kinds. Nuts. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Here's a man rejoicing in salvation, rejoicing in God, exalting in Christ, rejoicing in tribulation. And all the time he's going through this thing, he has a burden and I'd like to kill him. I have a continual sorrow in my heart and heaviness. Why? Well, it's a burden for souls. I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, damned, cursed, lost. Notice Paul doesn't say, I do wish. It's optative, it's subjunctive, it's I could. I could. There's only one man who ever said, I will be accursed for my brethren, my kingdom, and according to the flesh, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I do make myself accursed. I will become accursed. Nobody else ever said it. But Paul said, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Notice the expression. Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, the two southern tribes. And yet he says his kinsmen are Israelites, not Jews. And I say this because you should go back again and review our remarks on what constitutes a Jew and what doesn't, according to the Bible. And we made these comments under Romans chapter 2, verse 28, 29, 
in Romans chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And if any book are ever overthrew the fanatical ravings of Garner Ted Armstrong, it's the Holy Bible. You know, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Art thou a master in Israel? And Nicodemus was a Judean Jew. You try to get a Judean Jew separated from Israel, you got a head full of rocks. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? The Lord adopted them and called Israel his firstborn in Exodus. And the glory, the glory of God appeared to him, and the Lord said, This generation has seen my glory. And the covenants, the Lord made the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. And the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And the service of God, the book of Leviticus. And the promises in Deuteronomy about the land. Whose are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of whom is concerning the flesh, Mary, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Great passage. Now, don't you know they'd mess with that? Don't you know these corrupt new Bibles have erased that verse 5 so you'd miss the deity of Jesus Christ? Why, even Tischendorf, Lockman, and Wettstein read as the King James. And yet some of these new Bibles say, Christ came who was over all, period. Let God be blessed forever. Amen. Why, you dirty, God-forsaken old hypocrites, you... Why do you pretend to be a Christian? You attack the deity of Christ and change the punctuation to erase his deity, and then you say the punctuation is not in the original manuscript. Why, you dirty two-faced four-flusher, you. You ought to go back to plumbing or being an electrician or something you never been called to preach. You're probably not even saved. I know a lot of electricians and plumbers that are saved that have better sense than to mess with that. Christ, who is over all, what is Christ? He's God blessed forever. Amen. He's God, blessed forever. You say, well, it shouldn't read that way. It shouldn't. All right, then notice again how the infallible English straightens out the obscure Greek manuscripts. When we have trouble with these Greek scholars and they begin to mess with our Bible, the Lord has always given us dumb, poor, ordinary, common people, a good standard to go by and judge by. And we read in 1 John 5, 20, Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. 1 John 5.20 This antecedent Jesus Christ This is the true God and eternal life. When the Greek is in doubt throw it out. And notice how the Holy Spirit will magnify and exalt and illuminate the English text so it can correct the errors of Greek scholarship. God, blessed forever, amen, amen. Then Paul had a burden for these unsaved Israelites. He loved them. He loved them so much he'd almost go to hell to get them saved. He had a real compassion and burden for souls. Then he says in verse 6, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. In plain of words, some of these covenant children, these Israelites, got saved. For example, well, for example, Paul. Paul was a covenant child. Look at verse 6. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. That is, in the true sense. Neither because are they the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac, see, not Ishmael, shall thy seed be called. That is, now illustrating what he was trying to say, they which are the children of the flesh, that is, just because a man's a literal, physical, visible descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that doesn't mean he's a child of God. These are not the children of God. You see that? In other words, a man can be a literal, physical, visible Jew and be part of the chosen people, but not a child of God. A child of God comes by birth. Now, the literal, physical, visible Jew is a member of the chosen people, the chosen nation, the chosen race. That's all very well, all very true. And you might review our comments uh, about this under uh, Romans 3, 1 to 3. But a child of God is something else. For he says the children of the promise are counted for the seed. You see, birth, birth, birth. They're counted for the seed. And here begins a discussion of the difference between a literal, physical, visible seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and a spiritual seed typified by Isaac. And there is a more complete discussion of this same subject 
in Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4, which every child of God should read. If you don't have a Bible, get one, or get this talking Bible that Brother Harold Rawlings put out, and get that Bible and get him to read for you Galatians 3 and Galatians 4, and you'll get the Holy Spirit's commentary on the text. We're now reading in Romans chapter 9, verse 8. All right, we'll stop here in our volume, side 2 of volume 12, and our next volume, volume 13, will take up a discussion of Romans chapter 9, verse 9, and cover the great pastures that deal with predestination and election. John Calvin stumbled and broke his theological neck in this passage we're about to study in our next volume, volume 13, and Burkhoff, Dabney Hodge, and Kuiper, and uh, Bob Ross and John Gilpin and the Baptist Examiner out of uh, Kentucky also stumbled at this stumbling block, as did Arthur W. Pink. We'll talk about this more when we discuss the great doctrines of election and predestination on volume 13. Now, as we've remarked on the previous volume, volume 12, we are here dealing with Israel for a while and its uh, relationship to salvation and its future. He's been talking about the predestination of the Christian back in Romans chapter 8, and the word predestinate occurred there for the first time in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. <clears throat> now he begins to talk about predestination as it is related to Israel. And he says in verse 9, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And of course the reference is to Isaac. And not only this, not only the reference to Isaac, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, and of course this is a reference to Jacob, then a parenthesis, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, if the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said of her, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now notice in this passage, foreknowledge is involved, and the purpose of God in election is involved. And notice in both cases, foreknowledge is present. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And notice in both cases, election is in a temporal setting. Now this is very important. The teaching that God elected people before the foundation of the world is nonsense. Election is based on foreknowledge, and there isn't one place in the New Testament where the word election occurs where the context is not speaking of a temporal operation. For example, in speaking of the election of Christians themselves, the saved people, he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, through what? Sanctification of the Spirit. But that took place when you got saved sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross unto obedience and the sprinkling when you received him. Notice how the term election and elect never refers to anything but a temporal situation. There is no such thing as eternal election. That's a Calvinistic theological term. There is nothing like it in the Bible. Israel as God as elect was not even a nation until Abraham. Every one of the settings is temporal. There's no such thing as eternal election. You say, well, where did Calvin get off then? Well, he got off in Ephesians 1 where Bullinger got off. He got off in Ephesians chapter 1 where it said in the passage, verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, you wouldn't think a man could get as messed up as John Calvin got in these matters, but it's amazing how messed up you can get when you begin to reject the Bible. Calvin denied the inspiration of Acts 7, verse 15 and 16. He denied the inspiration of Matthew 27, verse 9. He denied the inspiration of Zechariah 11, 12 to 17, and treated Jonah as a fable. He was an amillennial baby sprinkler who had his levitas burned at the stake for disagreeing with him about a theological question, and if you're a sure enough outgoing all the way 100% Calvinist, you're a Bible heretic. You say, well, Charles Spurgeon, yeah, but we've read all that stuff, you see. We know that Charles Haddon Spurgeon and Whitfield were moderate Calvinists. Anytime you doubt Spurgeon's 
moderateness, you look at a collection of his works. Now I realize the Baptist Examiner just publishes his Calvinistic works, but Spurgeon preached thousands of sermons. He has hundreds of sermons in print. Not one of them out of twenty is a dissertation on election and predestination. Do you realize that? He was a moderate Calvinist, as are all evangelistic preachers. Now, a real Calvinist who believes you are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, and that's what the text says, Ephesians 1, 4, has a rather peculiar way of ignoring several thousand verses. For example, in Galatians 4, 7 to 8, it says God didn't even know you before you were saved. The word chosen, as it occurs in Luke 10, 42, Acts 1, 24, Acts 13, 17, John 15, 16, Acts 22, 14 to 15, is a temporal choosing. You say, well, this choosing here says before the foundation of the world. Yeah, but you see, that's the whole problem. Calvin didn't read the text as it stood. Calvin read, according as God hath chosen us, when we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. But you weren't in Christ before the foundation of the world. If you were, you fell out of him. Because 1 Corinthians 15 says, In Adam all die, as does Romans 5. And then you must have fallen out of Adam after he sinned and fell back into Christ when you got saved. Now, how stupid can you get, friend? You weren't in Christ before the foundation of the world. The text said that you were, that God chose you in him. In plain words, when God decided who he'd save and who he wouldn't save, see 2 Timothy 1, 9, the Lord said, I'm not going to choose anybody unless they're in Christ. He hath chosen us in him. And notice how this is explained in verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted. How? In the beloved. 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now you listen to me. You didn't get into Jesus Christ till you accepted him. You didn't get into him till God put you in him. And God didn't put you into him until you were redeemed by blood. And that didn't take place in eternity. That took place right down there on Calvary's cross. You say, well, it was predestinated, chose for the foundation of the world. The only thing that was predestinated was that if you got in, got in him, God would choose you. He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. But you took him, and by wicked hands you slew him. Acts 2, verse 23. God doesn't choose any man unless that man is in Christ. And in Ephesians you're told that God chose us in him. Now the problem comes up, when were you in him? Calvin never got it figured. As a matter of fact, when you read Calvin's testimony of salvation, it reads a great deal like Philip Schaff's. Get you volume 8 of Philip Schaff's Church History, volume 7, and read about Calvin's conversion. His conversion was a change of intellectual attitude toward the fundamentals of the faith. And the day he died, just like Origen and Philip Schaff, he connected baby sprinkling with regeneration. You better be careful that stuff. Why, you weren't in Christ before the foundation of the world. Christ had no body until he went back to glory. He had a local church before Acts 2, but he had no organic body in which to put people as part of his bone and part of his flesh, Ephesians 5. You weren't in Christ in Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, because he was walk, walking around the body of flesh and bones you couldn't get into. You see? In plain of words, Christ was the instrument through which God decided to choose. And the Lord said, if I choose anybody, I'm going to choose them in Christ. 
Now, the Lord made up his mind to do that before the foundation of the world. But if you're dumb enough to think that you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, you know what you are? You're a Bible-rejecting heretic is what you are. Because you were in Adam, according to Calvin. Well, tell me something. If you were in Adam and you're now in Christ, and you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, you know what you did, honey? You fell out of Christ and got into Adam and then fell out of Adam and got into Christ, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you didn't fall out of Christ again and get in the devil. That's the system you're dealing with. And when a man starts on this eternal election and eternal predestination, that's the trap he's taking you into, and you better ditch him at the first turn in the interstate. Our election is temporal. And all choosing takes place when you receive Jesus Christ. Notice the predestination was based on foreknowledge in 829, and in every case in the Bible, it's based on foreknowledge as we're going to see. The Lord sees who will and who will not accept his Son, and on the base of their willingness, on the base of their willingness, he predestinates them to be conformed to the image of his Son. You can't eliminate the free will of man. The term free will is a Bible expression. The term total depravity, sovereignty of God, irresistible grace, unconditional election are the theological terms of dead orthodox apostates. You won't find them in the Bible. All right, Romans chapter 9, verse 12. It was said to her, the elders shall serve the younger. That is, he knew about these boys before they were born. It doesn't say he chose them in eternity. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, thee so have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. We might as well get the whole passage. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now when Calvin got to these verses, and of course uh, he was preceded by some like kindred, Augustine uh, messed up the same way in his blasphemous theology, which teaches you can only be elected by being sprinkled into the Catholic Church. You said, now, Brother Ruckman, now, Brother Ruckman, you're afoot. Do some reading. And he saith to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Somebody says, well, look at here. Pharaoh was damned. He was hardened. The king's heart, you know, was in the hand of the Lord and these kind of things. He turned it to whoever he will, you know, that kind of business. And folks say, well, Pharaoh never had a chance, you know. God hardened him and had mercy on Moses. But aren't you forgetting something? Number one, you're dealing with the author of the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament who had no Calvary, no new birth, no spiritual circumcision. And you're dealing with a man as he was related to Israel. You're not dealing with the personal elements of salvation. You're not even dealing with New Testament salvation in the passage. You're also forgetting something else. You're forgetting that the Lord foreknew what Pharaoh would do. And long before ever God ever touched him one time to harden him, he said, Exodus 3, 19, I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. You see, the Lord knew what he was going to do before he touched him one time. Notice this is also true of the calling of Abraham. When the Lord called Abraham out of, out of Ur of the Chaldees, the whole matter was based on foreknowledge, not arbitrary election. In Genesis 18, verse 17, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him. See that? Foreknowledge precedes election. Foreknowledge precedes predestination. Every time the matter occurs, somebody said, poor old Judas, you never had a chance. He predestinated, etc. Yeah, but you need to read your Bible instead of all this Calvinistic Puritan stuff. Did you notice in John chapter 6 in a reference to Judas, verse 70 and 71, it is said in verse 64, there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew, K-N-E-W, knew 
knew from the beginning who they the worth believe not and who should betray him. You see the foreknowledge? There it goes. And notice the predestination in the passage. John 6, 65. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except were given to him of my Father. And verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. A man says, Well, then there you go. If God doesn't draw you, nothing you can do. If you're not one of the elect and God doesn't draw you, why nothing you can do? Yeah, but you know, you, your trouble is you're asleep about half the time. And if you get the wax out of your ears and listen, you might learn something. Did you know any man can ask God to draw him? In the Song of Solomon, the bride says in verse 4 of chapter 1, Draw me! Christ said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. What do you mean you can't get drawn? I talked to one of these old hard shell Baptists one time down in Florida. I think they ought to call him a hard head instead of a hard shell. A little boy spit tobacco juice out across the porch while he talked, and he said, Well, the thing it is to be shall be. You believe that, don't you? You know, big deal. And I said, You know something, Pop? I said, after you've been burning hell about 10 million years, it won't do you any good to talk that way. He, his eyes kind of opened, his mouth dropped, a little juice right out of one corner, and he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, guess, then, I guess you're right. Never thought of that. <laughs> Isn't that pitiful? You think of some of these hillbillies in Kentucky taking that Baptist examiner and sitting around going to hell worrying about whether they're one of the elect or not, and trying to figure out the absolute decrees of predestination in the internal mind of an infinite God while they're rejecting his son. What a crock, brother. Now, when Calvin got to Romans 9 and 16, he split his britches. He read, So then it is not of him that willeth. And then you know what he did? He did just what Burkhoff and Dabney and Hodge and Arthur W. Pink do. He ran that verse over to Philippians, and so help me, oh, so help me, Dabney, Kuyper, and Hodge. When he got to Philippians and got in chapter 213, he read, It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know what that crazy nut did? He said, You see, a man can't even will to get saved. God has to will in him ignoring the fact that the context of Philippians was the man who was already saved and ignoring the fact that in Romans chapter 9, verse 16, it had nothing to do with a man willing to receive Christ. And so when John Calvin got through with his godless depraved mess, and that's what it was, you say well, a lot of godly people followed. Yeah, they followed the good things, and some had better sense to take all of it. That's very true. Now, those who followed all the way and set up a theocracy in New England, like he set it up in Geneva, used to burn people up there, too. And the Catholics will never let you forget that. But a lot of good people like Charles Spurgeon and George Whitfield and other moderate Calvinists like Moody and Billy Sunday and J. Frank Norris and Bob Jones, Sr. applied these doctrines moderately. Bob Jones, Sr. was raised a Methodist. He got convinced about things, got immersed in water and picked up the Baptist teachings of eternal security. But he was always a moderate Calvinist. Now, it's true that Calvin did some good. It's true the Huguenots and the Covenanters picked up things from him and used them to stand for the faith. But now, with an open Bible and the Holy Spirit in the 20th century, there's no excuse for a man being as ignorant as John Calvin was of the Word of God. For example, Romans chapter 9, verse 16, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Plainly tells you that you can't make God have mercy upon you by exerting your will. You've got to do it his way. And his way is Christ. God hath chosen us in him. Now, do you understand what it means? If you don't, turn to John chapter 1. And this time, instead of using the corrupt uh, emendation of text, usually by, used by 
Zodiades and other Greek scholars who think they're smart enough to overrule the Holy Spirit. Go by the text as it stands, and this time you'll get the meat. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name, watch it, which were born not of the of blood, nor of the will, of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And don't you let any so-called Greek scholar tell you the references to Jesus Christ and erase the cross reference to Romans. He'll be able to wind up like John Calvin wound up. He's plainly telling you, you can't will the new birth. It is not of him that willeth. You cannot will yourself into a new birth. If you're born, God gives you birth. But bless your soul, you can will to believe, because the verse said, As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. Now, do you understand that? Are you going to let some educators talk you out of it? The thing that you can't will is a new birth. You can certainly will to receive Jesus Christ. But when you receive Jesus Christ, then the Lord says, Okay, that's the fellow I'm going to have mercy on. That's the man I'm going to choose. And that's the man I'm going to give a new birth to. Do you understand that? Are you certain you understand that? If you don't get anything in Romans 9, get that. John Calvin never did. And many of these men who can speak, read, and write Hebrew, Latin, and Greek are just as blind as a bat coming in backwards when it comes to spiritual truth. All right, Romans 9, 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. I? For the antecedent of I is the Scripture. Does the Scripture raise people up? That my name, the name of the Scripture? Why, Paul, you old bibliolater, you've used the word Scripture instead of the word God. Suppose well, that's all right, I do it habitually. <laughs> notice he did the same thing over in Galatians. Did you notice that? In Galatians 3, 8, he said the Scripture had the power to foresee things. That isn't all. When the Scripture preached the gospel of Abraham, there wasn't any Scripture there. Now, what do you make of that? Here are these blasts of idolaters talking about the original manuscripts, the original manuscripts, the original manuscripts, while rejecting the Scripture that God has given them, and that God has preserved at the cost of the blood of martyrs, and saying, this verse should read this, Unfortunately, the Greek meaning is not brought out. This is an unhappy rendering of the word, and more accurately it should say, or as they say in the biblical review, the Greek text says, my, what a lying stratagem. A man says the Greek text says, which Greek text, honey? Fischendorf, Tregellis, Lockman's, Griesbox, Alfred's, Weiss, Nestle's, Weiss. Which Greek text, fella? Erasmus? Stephanus, Elzever, Mill, Walton. That, that's the latest thing these days. They put out a little paper called the Biblical Review, and then they say, the Greek text says. And that poor kid sitting there actually thinks there is such a thing as the Greek text. If you're going to say the Greek text, you imply one of two things. One, there's only one, and that's a lie. And number two, if there's more than one, there's one which you take to correct your King James Bible with. In either case, you're full of demons. God never taught you to correct your King James Bible. If you correct your King James Bible, you learn that from a man. You know what the trouble with some of you Christians is? You follow men. God never showed you any errors in that book. You had to have a man teach him to you, didn't you? Didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, you old rascal. Yes, you did. 
you had to have the leading majority of accredited scholarship show you where they were smarter than God, didn't you? Yes, you did. But Paul used the word scripture instead of God. The scripture saith the Pharaoh, but my, 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 the quotation Exodus 9, 16, the Lord saying it, not the scripture. Furthermore, the scripture at this time that said it hadn't even yet been written. Paul thought pretty high of the scripture, didn't he? But of course he didn't think as high as the psalmist did. Old David says back there in the Old Testament, he says, Lord, he said, you've magnified your word above all your name. Psalm 138, verse 2. How precious this book should be to us. How closely we should guard its purity. How thankful we should be for its power. How we ought to preach it and memorize it and learn it and teach it and study it and hide it in our heart that we might not sin against him. How we should exalt and magnify it and how we should ignore its critics of any persuasion for they seek to turn us from it. The scripture said, I raised you up, I've got the power, and I did it so my name could be cleared throughout all the earth. Father, bless the reading of your word. May your word be magnified. May your name be greatly exalted above all things and all names in this world and the world to come. May it bear fruit in these that listen at this moment. For Jesus' sake, amen.